Thank you all for coming today. I'm Amelia Rzinski, and I'm a senior here majoring in economics and international relations. At Tufts, I'm on the executive boards of Tufts Investment Banking Club, Jumbo's for Nonprofits, Tufts Financial Group, and Tufts Student Giving. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to Civic Life Lunch Talk called Building Community and Connection Through Tech with Civic Roundtable. This is a packed week at Tisch College, so before I introduce you to today's speakers, I want to share a few campus events and opportunities happening this week and next. Tomorrow night, students can meet and network with some incredible alumni and employees from a variety of social impact careers at the Public Service and Social Impact Networking Night. On Wednesday night, Join us in the chaplaincy for the Russell Lecture on Spiritual Life with our artist in residence and professor of the practice, D1. Dee's talk will focus on lyrics, prayer, and spiritual repair. The Education for Public Inquiry and International Citizenship program's annual symposium will be this Thursday and will bring together scholars, practitioners, and students to discuss critical issues like the Sustainable Development Goals, Future of International Organizations, UN Peace Operations, global health, and more. And next week on Wednesday, March 13th, we will welcome well-known author and creator and host of the Terrible Thanks for Asking podcast, Noah, Nora McGurney, for a special talk called How Are You No Really? You can find more information about these events and register for them at tishcollege.tufts.edu slash events. Today's guests, Madeline Smith and Josh Steven, are the young entrepreneurs and founders, along with their colleague, Austin Boral, who couldn't be with us today, behind the new tech platform, Civic Roundtable. Austin, Madeline, and Josh created and launched Civic Roundtable with the goal of revolutionizing how 22 million government and public sector workers across 90,000 agencies and associations share information, build institutional memory, and solve problems in the communities in which they work. And as former government workers and veterans of Mark 43, the founders understood firsthand the complexities of working in government and utilizing technology. Described as Reddit meets LinkedIn and the inaugural 2023 Forbes 30 under 30 local Boston list, Civic Roundtable is a collaboration platform designed to connect public servants in real time and to make the public sector more efficient. It does this by combining a secure space with peer-to-peer -peer communication for users to ask questions, collaborate, and share best practices across levels and functions of government. The platform has grown rapidly since its 2022 launch. Civic Roundtable has onboarded over 5,000 users, representing more than 500 government agencies working on issues like homelessness prevention, election administration, and economic development. And it's recently raised a 5 million seed round led by venture capital firm General Catalyst. Not only is Civic Roundtable the only collaboration tool purpose-built for government and hosted on AWS GovCloud, but it's headquarters here in Boston. In fact, Madeline, Austin, and Josh, alumni of Harvard and Brandeis Universities, teamed up to incubate and launch Civic Roundtable at the Harvard Innovation Lab with support from Harvard Business School, Harvard Kennedy School, and MIT. We're delighted to have Madeline and Josh here today. They will be in conversation with Jessica Byrnes, Tisch College's Communications Program Manager, while also giving a short presentation and demo. Please welcome Madeline Smith and Josh Seaton. Hello, welcome. Um, I'm Jess Burns, thank you all for coming. Please, these are informal, so please help yourself to seconds for lunch whenever. Um, so thank you both for coming. Now I'm Josh, we're thrilled to have you. Um, and I know you wanted to start off, you have some slides that I think would be great for folks to see the product that we're talking about, Civic Roundtable. So to pick that off, um, I wanted to ask if you could share some of Civic Roundtable's origin story um, and specifically why you decided to create it and launch it, what your early sort of process was in making that happen um, and how the platform works. Sure. So really happy to be here today. Thank you all for being here and having lunch with us. Um, my name is Madeline, Josh. So we were really inspired after in college, studied a lot of like social science topics and got really energized by the idea that there's a lot of really good work happening in the public sector. There are a lot of people working on really important topics, whether that's preventing homelessness, whether it's running elections, whether it's building 
sustainable business communities, like you name your topic, the government has some hand in it. And we got super, super inspired by the idea that technology has an opportunity to really make an impact in how people go about these problems. And when you think about technology that people use in government today, it's like extremely archaic. There's a huge gap in opportunity there. Like you go home and you can do everything on your phone and everything online, but you go into your work at a government agency, especially one that's a hyper-local government agency, maybe not super well resourced, and you're using pen and paper for most things. You're using tools that were built in like the 1980s. There's just huge opportunities to bring new tech to government. And so Josh and I worked together for a bunch of years in the criminal justice world, thinking about how to build technology that helps revolutionize how you capture 911 data. And we sort of saw that firsthand. We traveled to a couple hundred cities. We were like really on the ground, just seeing what are people using? How do these jobs work? What does the government actually use? What can be used? What are the security requirements? And so we put our heads together after a couple of years on the road doing that work to think, all right, there's so many other opportunities and so much else we've been inspired by from this sort of countrywide tour um, and just got really energized about entrepreneurship at the intersection of public private sector and also opportunity for tech and mission to yeah, I would also just add one thing that we've always been really excited about is really focusing on folks who are driven by mission, but don't necessarily get as much spotlight as they should. And so one of the things we set up right at the outset is how can we gather voices of folks with lived experience and really promote a set of tools that allow them to shape these important missions, but also give them things like time back and energy back. And so uh, round table, which you'll see is a nexus of a lot of those threads being pulled together. That's awesome. Um, do you want to walk us through a little bit of what it looks like? And how yeah, much? sure. Okay, cool. So, Should I just go? Yes. Okay. Feel free to, um, I'll shuffle around here too. Yeah, and I'll stand. I know you're being blinded. But no, that's perfect. Like, okay, this will take two seconds. So we thought it would be helpful to just ground what we're talking about and what we actually build and the problem we're trying to solve. So high level, Civic Roundtable is really about using technology to make government more effective and efficient. And our core belief is it's about equipping people on the front lines of really important challenges. So the person coordinating homelessness prevention in their county with the tools and information they need to be successful. And though that might sound like a simple proposition in the world of government, that's actually really complicated. And basically high level, you know, government is powered by people. Here are two examples of the type of people that we work with at Civic Roundtable. So, one is Kathy, she runs an office of the child advocate. And what that means is something goes wrong, like child goes missing in your state. It's someone like Kathy, whose job it is to figure out what went wrong, coordinate with all the agencies to figure out how to make sure it doesn't happen again, You know, figure out what happened to the kid. So really important work in one arena. And then the other is example of someone like Bill, who's an election clerk. So that means that someone in your county registering voters, recruiting poll workers, counting bills, you know, this is the type of person who's really come under fire in the last couple of years. He's like very nervous about the upcoming election and there's a lot going on in his world too. So people like Kathy and Bill, they're pulled in all these directions. They're responsible for mission critical work, but they're looking left, right, and center to get that work done. They're part of different groups. They're part of associations. They're looking at many different tools. It's just a really complicated world when you work in government. And a lot of people feel like they don't have the resources, they don't have the time, and they don't have the information that they need to kind of answer really important questions in their community. So 22 million people like Kathy and Bill working on all these different types of topics. And these are anything from like examples we've mentioned, running elections, preventing homelessness, keeping kids safe, racial equity. Like these are all things that public servants do every day and especially public servants who work locally in your cities and states. So Civic Roundtable we built by first interviewing a couple hundred people who work in these jobs all over the country. And we found a couple things that were really important to them. The first is that oftentimes people in government, you might be working in the city next door and have the exact same question and thus just not know that somebody else has answered your question. So something like, how do I implement this new type of technology? How do I buy this type of technology? Does anyone have a policy to do X or Y? These are things that people in government are answering real time all the time, and it's really hard to get answers across. And so what we built is a platform that helps you do that. So it's sort of this one-stop shop. Who can I ask about X? What are the examples from the past about Y? You know, how can I ask people quick questions and get quick answers? So think of this as like a hyper-secure, almost Q&A, 
for people in government to share information, get answers, and kind of find what they need. Which sounds simple. It's something we do all the time in sort of school worlds or in, in uh, non-government jobs, but it's really hard to find and source that network when you work in the public sector. So we call this a collaboration platform for public service. It's really enabling agencies and others to reach their whole network, facilitate that type of peer-to-peer -peer Q&A, build knowledge bases and information that people can use for, you know, as people enter new jobs, people leave their jobs, find what they need, and then generate some really interesting insights about how people use the platform, what are big questions in government today, and really have your finger on the pulse for what public servants care about. So another view of that, uh, which we can talk more about if people are interested in, but really it's about taking the best of technology that exists in other tools and then building it in a way that people in the government can use. So be hyper secure, hyper intuitive, and then let you cross cut all the different topics that people in government use today. And then lastly, and really quickly, this is like a lot of info, but <laughs> high level, you know, our focus as an early stage product has been, what can we do to solve a problem today for people in government? And that's been really about get people and information and resources into a central secure space. The next sets of things we're thinking about are what can the best of technology do? Government is like amazing at producing content. There's like all this white paper information, all these people, all these policies, like really interesting things you can do with that when you think about like, the role of AI and helping search and parse that information about generating templates and information. So this is the kind of thing that helps really, um, you know, solve problems for people in government. And we're really excited about, like you said, a bunch of times sort of bringing best of mission and tech to a space that's been really hard on the adoption front and kind of building a business centered around creating a lot of value for people who do really important jobs. So I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Well, I'm going to keep this up in case you guys want to revisit it for anything. Yeah, but let me know if it's really blinding you. Um, so you talked a little bit about the public sector landscape right now and sort of the why of like why you built this platform. Is that something? Clearly, those are issues that you felt when you both were working at Mark Forty Three. Um, and are those sort of the key themes that came out when you were interviewing folks across the table? Like, what are some of the other? The paths not traveled that you know issues that came up that um you felt like these are really important but you know we need to narrow down on specific i think one thing that kept coming up during all our interviews was just this complete geyser of information thrown at local practitioners and so if you're a local practitioner and you have a question you might have a google drive of ten thousand documents and you might google search yourself and find six different things and there might be a federal agency that's telling you to do these three things but one thing we really narrowed in on is how do you take all of that information and make that knowledge and that was sort of like a very informative thought for us is like we want to be the path that when someone has a problem they can turn to this resource and in five minutes can do something that helps them with their job and so right now a lot of the way the problem is solved is like you hire a team of 10 people to comb through all these data sets or all these documents and then it's three weeks and you've actually missed a window of making the big things happen so that's something that like i think we narrowed in on really quickly and was just universally across government something that every single person pretty much brought up so that was really interesting for us yeah and i would add to we ran a bunch of experiments with existing tools so we would build a group of public servants on a topic and put them in a slack group or in microsoft teams or in like some community tools and the thing we saw over and over again was in government, let's say you're responsible for homelessness prevention. That's like a multi-organization job. You have to talk to food pantries, homeless shelters, the YMCA, a bunch of different nonprofits. Like coordinating that might mean touching a hundred different organizations with points of contact who are changing all the time. A lot of tools today are really built for like, I work at this office and we all use Slack. It's really awesome for that use case. Or like we are building a company knowledge base. So I'm gonna use this tool. What's really challenging and breaks down for government is this idea of the crossing of organizational boundaries and like building a solution that's secure for government, but accessible to all those other groups, mm -hmm. especially some groups that are running really small nonprofits, for example, that might not have a lot of tool infrastructure to begin with. So that was a problem that kept coming up too. How do you build for that? Yeah, and as you're sort of going through that process, particularly in the initial stages and completing it, and what are some of the biggest challenges you face both in like, 
identifying the set of problems that you were going to address, um, and then launch, building the platform, launching it. Um, so those challenges, and then what are some of the challenges now that you're in sort of a different stage of growth? Like, what are the challenges that you're facing now? Yeah, I think just the early stages, um, there's a lot of resistance and change just in the government and like change management and training and meeting folks where they are is something really, really important. So in the early stages, I think like answering this pivotal question of why is this just not another tool that I have to log into or why is this different from three other initiatives that we've tried in the past that have kind of, you know, flamed out a little bit. That was really something we thought a lot about in the early stages. And so we like spent a lot of time on like, how can we really show impact and value quickly? Because in our part of our thesis is that the quicker you can show value, the quicker some or the more likely someone can keep using the tool. So you don't have like 10 times at the plate. If someone logs in six times and they're not getting value those six times, they're probably not going to come back. And so that was really one of the early, early questions. And then we kind of tried to run all of these technical experiments to try to like orient around that. Um, and Matt, maybe we'll talk about some of those. Yeah, no, I think other pieces, like one on the technical side, we made a call really early on to like move from discovery, like doing all the interviews, triangulating the problem to just trying something. And so we built a no code version of our tool. It was like really cheap to build, really quick to get stood up. And we learned way more from that early phase of piloting and launching that than we would have from another like 100 interviews. So I think that was like a really good piece of tactical advice. Like the sooner you kind of get going, the sooner you can learn more about what does and doesn't work in your idea. I think the other piece for us, when we think about what we're thinking about now, um, one of our visions for Civic Roundtable is that if you work in government, let's say you're an election clerk in the city, you can log in and see everything that's relevant to you in one place, whether it's stuff going on in your state, whether it's stuff coming up from the national, conversations around what's going on in the political climate, whether it's, you know, help from different nonprofits who are supporting you, like you can log in Roundtable and see all those different groups. And so there's this tension always of, do you go deep in one area, like get every single group in the election world on this platform, or do you build something that's as generalizable as possible and kind of continue working in these other spaces too? Um, and we, we want to do both, like we have lofty goals for ourselves, but it's hard to pick and choose the sequencing. So that's kind of where we're at today is how do you build for all those different use cases. Well, on that note, I'm interested in sort of your outreach and promotion of the product. Like how are you thinking about building awareness um, among the constituencies that you're trying to get to use it? Um, and I think you're still a relatively small team. Super small. Okay, so how has that been going? One thing that works to our benefit in government is it's not a place where like flashy marketing really helps you. It's like a very, it's actually the opposite. Like you want to be unsexy. You want to look like you're fitting into what's there. You want to be safe and secure. And sometimes it's like the opposite of what tech startups try to do, which is be like flashy, young, cool brand. Like we're trying not to be that like deliberately. And uh, so we work a lot off referrals. Like let's build a really good relationship with someone who's really well-respected in the space. Like the preeminent woman on homelessness prevention that all states call when they have a question. Like let's get that person to start talking about Civic Roundtable. And so we'll spend a lot of time building a, a stable of champions and then helping them sort of talk about our value prop on conferences and, and other things like that. So we don't do a ton of like outward pushing, but I mean, back to change. We're also a really small team. We're like eight people. So. And headquartered in Boston? Yeah. Right? Awesome. You looked like you were about to. I was just going to say two on that front. We are not a cool team, but we are a very enthusiastic team. Um, and so what we lack in cool suaveness, we make up in showing up in a lot of places and really, you know, pounding the pavement. And with a lot of folks, like maybe you're like a homelessness person in a very small state, they maybe never spoken to someone who cares about building a product for them. And that's like another one of our secret weapons in our arsenal is like, Folks have never even been spoken to on what makes your job more helpful. Like, what do you care about? And those are the types of questions that we've gotten a lot of um, mileage out of, and, and it's very exciting. Um, so, yeah, good point, Josh. One of the first things we did is one of our first people we were working with were all election clerks in the state of Utah. And that's been like a really tumultuous state. Like, a third of all people in that job are new. A lot of people quit. It's like very political. It's like a tough environment right now. And Josh and I like rented a Jeep Wrangler and drove to every county in the state over the course of a week. And people were like, 
freaking out. They were like, how did you even find us? Like, I can't believe yeah. you got here. Everywhere we showed up, there were like tourism bags. Like people were really proud to show off their towns and like really surprised we had made the trip. We saw so many so that... fossils too. Like yeah. literally, yeah. Just, like, so... how many fossil sites did we see? Like a hundred of them. No, I just think that's a really good point because yeah. I think people feel like they're doing really important public service work and care a lot about their communities and the topics they're working on. And they feel extremely underappreciated. And so we want to tap into that spirit and build a community space where you feel supported, people have your back, you can celebrate your accomplishments. And a big piece of that, especially as a young team, is like showing up. So, well, you guys are doing a really great job of providing my question transitions for me. So thank you. Um, it's almost like you gave us the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned the election, and you also mentioned like creating spaces that are supportive of folks. So I'm thinking about election 2024. Um, and how you see Civic Roundtable playing a role in addressing issues specific to that, which are so many um, and diverse issues, anything from like turnover rates, staff shortages, poll worker shortages, cybersecurity, misinformation, um, like physical attacks on election workers, all of that. How are you thinking about um, all of the issues related to the election and then also like capacity? Because I'm sure that's, you know, a huge concern. Yeah. So one thing we are have the like unique, like honestly privilege is working with election officials across the country. And I'm sh I encourage everyone to volunteer for an election, you know, assist because that is an incredibly difficult job and an incredibly overlooked job. And so um, just one plug this year more than ever, it's like a really good time to, uh, to support the cause there. Um, would say one thing that is really top of mind for the folks we're working with is mis and disinformation. And when there is a gap of inf gap of information, that is where mis and disinformation actually can start and can spread. And so one thing that we've really focused on as part of our product is yeah. trying to figure out how we can bring accurate and clear information from trusted sources to people really, really quickly. Because in the current state, maybe you have a question and it might take two weeks for someone from a state to get back to you. So we're really focused on how do you bring that trusted information to someone so they can take action that day and they have a, you know, a, a really rock solid response um, to a constituent that might ask some questions. And so there's a lot of, in that question, but that um, is at least where my mind is going in terms of uh, mis and disinformation. Got it. Um, so I know last month, uh, Civic Roundtable raised a $5 million seed round uh, by the venture capital firm General Catalyst, which you mentioned quickly before. That's huge. Congratulations. Um, how are you thinking about utilizing those funds, um, and particularly in the context of, you know, you mentioned you're an in-person team, you know, the future of Civic Roundtable's growth? I think a couple things. One is we're really excited about that because I think it's sometimes hard in our space to show you can actually build a really big business that does a lot of good in the public sector. And like, sometimes those things sound like an oxymoron. We were really excited to be able to show like, actually you can do that or at least hope to do that. I mean, we could still fail out here, but um, we are really excited about a couple of things. One is being able to build an engineering team that looks a lot like what you might see at a really well-resourced, like other types of companies, like people who really understand how to bring the best of, what there is to offer and then build that in a way that public sector can use. Like we have a team of people who have worked a lot in the government tech space and we're looking to bring people on with like really interesting like consumer experiences, like really focused on design and front end. Like how do you build great apps for people and do that for public servants who need that experience too. And then the other piece is really thinking about the future of what we want this to become. Like how can we be really like a bastion of really good thought leadership coming out of the frontline traffic and conversations where you know, a part of as part of this platform. So it's really about building the team and like shaping the vision. I agree. Totally. Um, so I'm thinking I want to shift a little bit to your personal and professional journeys of how you got to where you are. Um, is this sort of your first try at like creating and launching a platform of the scale? Definitely. So for me, Sorry, Matt. Go first. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I had always been really passionate about social science topics. I spent a lot of time studying sort of like the criminal justice world. I like did a big thesis in college where I was trying to understand like the Boston Police Department. What does that actually look like in theory versus practice? Like how do they engage with community groups? What does that actually mean? And like a ton of time kind of on the ground doing that work. And I think came 
to see a lot of the opportunity for technology just from the startup ride we had been on and got really excited about, didn't start that company, but we were super early employees and like doing that ride of a team I really loved working with on topic I thought was really important, led me to believe like, okay, the huge opportunity for tech. And I think also meeting people you love working with is like such a magical thing in the work world. It's really hard to do. So if you find like people who you feel really mission aligned with and set of issues you feel like are important to solve, I was super excited, like no matter what we stumbled on in the public sector world, like, okay, huge opportunity here, like would love to give it a shot. Um, so that was sort of my window in. Yeah, I would say a little bit of a different window, but very similar sentiment. Um, I did a lot of improv comedy uh, <laughs> in college and right after. And uh, part of what I always love the feeling is when you're on stage with someone and they're like, oh, I got your back. And no matter what you push forward, you, someone has your back and even a little idea can turn quickly into a big idea. So professionally, I'm always trying to seek that feeling. I'm um, very, very lucky with Malin and Austin to find that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I, I'm really motivated where you could build a product that feels like it has someone's back, but also a team that has your back. So that's been really, really exciting for me. Um, and one other thing I just wanted to share from part of this is, you know, I think when we started, you feel like you have to know every answer to get going, or there's all these things that could go wrong. I think what we found is just taking the first step and then reacting and then taking the next step and reacting has been really, really helpful for us. And so part of our team's philosophy is like better to start fast and try as fast as you can um, and not be scared of what's next because what's next is just another decision to make. And that's been really, really helpful for us as well. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Well, I mentioned when we were chatting earlier that we had a civic life lunch um, last week with the former ambassador to Switzerland and Liechtenstein, who had a number of very um, leadership roles in a number of different sectors. Um, and she gave a really interesting talk on the power of mistakes and failure um, and sort of reframing that to be um, something that's really valuable and essential to, you know, not just personal growth and development, but professional as well. Mm -hmm. Are there sort of like mistakes or failures that you think about either um, in sort of personal academic journeys to like where you got to where you are or in sort of creating this product that you feel like, um, you know, were essential to the end product that you have now? Good question. I think in the micro sense, like we make little mistakes every day. Like I think to Josh's point, Part of it is just trying and redirecting and learning and just being iterative. And I think that's part of the startup journey. So I think we probably make mistakes literally constantly about these little decisions we're we making. We to the wrong location to even get here. Yeah, that's just <laughs> <laughs> um, I think another like set of mistakes that at least I've seen in sort of a previous work experience is just the moment where kind of company objectives and you lose sight of the mission of what you set out to do. And I think one thing we've tried to weave through all of our work is that the company will succeed if the mission is working. And we sort of created like a value chain where if users are seeing value, then the company is growing, more people are buying it and more product can be built. So we're trying to create a really good cycle around aligning those two things, which is sometimes hard to do and have seen that gone wrong. Yeah. yeah just echo. Do you feel like um, now you're sort of in the tech entrepreneurial startup scene, but like, do you feel like the relationship toward making mistakes and sort of the process that you've talked about of like, we're going to take a step, even if we feel like we're not fully prepared to take that step and then iterate and et cetera. <laughs> Do you feel like that mentality is different within the different fields that you've worked in? I definitely think, at least in my professional experience, um, that we, we move a lot faster. So that has been um, really interesting. And I think in some ways, so I started my career as a federal consultant. So I worked at a big consulting firm and we used to spend a ton of time really analyzing a problem and being incredibly thoughtful. And I think that was awesome. I learned a ton and there's a great time and place for that. But now I think um, we're just moving a lot faster. So we're processing more information and gut feeling is more involved. So um, I just think like recognizing mistakes more quickly and not getting them weighing you down is like key to the key to the game here. Cause if we're like so focused on anything we did wrong every single day, I think we could just like sit in a room and be like, well, we made 10 mistakes in the last year. Like, and we could just get focused on that. So speed and like shaking it off, I think has been really key. Yeah. 
Um, Ambassador Levine would agree with you <laughs> from last week's That's talk. good to hear. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just have a few more questions and then I'll throw it out to all of y'all for questions. But if you, I mean, I know you just got this $5 million seed um, funding, which is incredible, but like, let's say you had a hundred million dollars funding come in. Like, what is the sort of dream that you, each of you wish you could do with Civic Roundtable if you weren't constrained by resources? I think we have a big vision of like you work on in the public sector in any job day one of your job the first thing you do is log into civic roundtable and you see everything you need you've got years of institutional knowledge any question you want to ask you can quickly triangulate who's the right person to reach out to what are the 10 examples of projects like this like if you just want to get going and you need to get an answer back to a community member, or you want to figure out how to implement something, or you have a big idea, like we can kind of transform the culture of government to be a little less reactive and a little more creative and exciting and innovative. And that's like a big vision. It'll take a lot to get there. But there's a million and one things we hear every day from our users, just because we're so in the weeds of kind of frontline conversations of little things that would make their jobs better. And every day we have like new ideas on the tech front, like, oh, if we could just build this, like that would really help this group, or if we could just do that. So if we had unlimited resources, we would have like armies of teams who are kind of like sent, you know, we want to be able to host one day, like the hackathon on how we solve homelessness prevention and what we can do to support with technology. And here are the 300 ideas. Okay, let's go actually build them. So I think like there's a urgency we feel can kind of get, get going on the innovation and technology front that that would help with. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add is we'd also probably have a path to meet folks where they are across mm -hmm. the country. I would love to say, oh, Roundtable has really helped me. And like, if we could go to each person and they're like, I understand the platform. I know how this helped me. This has made my life easier. Like, I think that would be really, really exciting. So, yeah. Well, hopefully you'll get there someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure Fingers you will. Fingers crossed. <laughs> So what advice would you give to folks, especially students and people interested in sort of the tech startup world um, to, as they, you know, embark either once they leave Tufts um, and are looking for jobs and also folks who are, you know, maybe in the early stages of their career and they're looking <clears throat> to get their foot in the door um, or even determine like, is this something that I want to pursue full time? I would say two things. One is if you're interested in tech and entrepreneurship in general, and you just want to, you have an idea and you've been thinking about it and you just want to get going. My advice would be, I think I just was in grad school. So I feel like I was part of similar mindset of a student, but in school, they teach a lot about like, take your time, like get to full understanding of the problem. Make sure you talk to a ton of people. But I also think you can really just trust your gut after a while. Like once you start hearing similar things from those conversations and once you start feeling like, you know what, I kind of know enough here, like I just encourage you to kind of take step one because you learn a lot more from that step than you do from the discovery phase of the project. And like the sooner you get to that, the better. So that's like one bucket of advice. The other is like if you're interested in like learning about entrepreneurship or joining a startup or or whatever, I think one Thing that's been really helpful like we've worked with a bunch of different students in different ways like doing little projects and things like that and one thing that's always stood out is when folks are super hungry about like I really you know have an understanding of what you're doing but I just want to get started and here are some ideas and they're willing to kind of be generative and a thought partner I think that matches the mindset of people who are in the startup world too because every day is like new information like two weeks at a startup sometimes is the equivalent of like months of learning at a different type of job. So people who are really hungry to like roll up their sleeves and just get started, I think it's really compelling. So. Yeah. Sorry, someone had a question. On that note, um, I'm in computer science. So I was wondering if you would have like a summer project or more generally advice on how to get involved from the technology side of things. Yeah, good question. I think, you know, we are like building out our tech team and thinking a lot about things like that. And we're always happy to chat with anyone who's excited about our mission or, you know, wants advice on that front. So can take it offline. Are you available on LinkedIn? Did you want to add anything to the advice question? I think the only other thing I would add is that value at a startup is a lot of different things. Like you don't need to start at a startup and it becomes the biggest story that you're telling all your friends about for your whole life. Like, one year really working and wearing a lot of different hats and trying a lot of stuff has value in and of itself. And so I think when you're early on, like having a lot of varied experience has been like very, very valuable to us. Um, and so 
just encourage you if something feels right, sounds good. Like mm -hmm. you don't need to think so many years of how it could turn out. It might just be a, a good choice for, for where you are. Amazing. Well, before I kick it off to the group, um, and you mentioned this is the last question a little bit, but are you <clears> open to, you know, students or folks reaching out if they are either just interested in learning from your professional journeys or looking to get involved with Civic Roundtable when I share your Yeah, no, addresses? definitely. I think okay. like so many people have helped us and like I was just a student too and a bunch of people are like helping me with copies and this and that. So if anyone ever wants to chat about this or just general advice or whatever, like happy to do that. And so let us know. And we're local, so. Um, amazing. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Um, questions? Yeah. Oh, I have two questions. My sure. first question is, it sounds like Neither of you guys actually have like a computer science background and I recognize how big of a undertaking it is to develop a whole platform. So how did you guys go about like gaining the knowledge to do that? Like, did you get like someone to actually code it or did you guys like the classes or what did you do? The first move we made was we did a no code version. So we were able to kind of do some of it ourselves and like hired someone to do it really cheaply mm -hmm. and then we were able to use the traction from that to actually hire like one of our old co-workers mm -hmm. who like actually knows how to code and he's done so <laughs> that was we didn't build it don't worry <laughs> um and my second question was um could you give like a concrete example of like <clears throat> a problem that a government worker might have that your website would be the solution for sure yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I think an example could be, you know, someone who works in elections. There's very specific legislative rules that are coming out from the state government, and it comes out in like a 50 page legalese huge document and it gets them and they might not have any clue of what that actually means or how they implement it. So folks are using our platform to connect with peers across the state. And they might say, well, what that really means is you have to put a sign 100 feet away as opposed to 50 feet away. And they might otherwise be just really focused on like understanding like the specifics of the legislation. And so lots of examples like that, but really you can think of it like taking complicated information overload and making it really digestible and easy to take action on. Okay, cool. Great question. Yeah. Oh. Hi, thank you, first of all, for having this talk. And then one of the user pain points you mentioned initially was how many government workers feel underappreciated, maybe even lonely in their jobs, um, having gone through problems like Dr. or uh, Susan, Susan Levine mentioned last time about having like the public not seeing that you're making the best decision possible when like there's worse decisions. So there's probably a lot of pressure on that front. So have you thought about adding like a social networking aspect to your app where you can connect maybe like people, some of the people in Utah to some people in another state who are facing similar issues. Like, have you thought about that at all? Yeah, that's like such a great point. And one of the main things we tried to do really early on was like, you know, a lot of people feel like islands in their job, mm -hmm. but they feel really appreciated when they get to talk to the other islands because it's mm -hmm. like, these are the people you get it. So that's one of the first things we did is like set up some forums basically to people who, you know, the person in rural Oregon who works on homelessness prevention, like alone in their county to the same person in, you know, outside of Washington who can do, you know, so people love doing it that way. It's some of our most active groups. Yeah, they could do like virtual coffee dates. Like yeah, yeah, we do a lot of like peer matching and things like okay. that too for people. Yeah, exactly. That's a great question. Uh, hi, thank you so much. I'm Felix. I'm a junior here studying IR. Um, I think from my generation's perspective, there is a, a big push towards mistrust in government and no longer trust in government anymore. But what I've noticed from the government side is a mistrust in technology and not really understanding how technology really works. Um, I'm curious if you've had any pushback from government workers to implement your program and how you go about taking that criticism and convincing them that technology isn't always as bad as it might seem. Yeah, great question and, and such a good thing that we wrestle with all the time. So yeah. I super appreciate that. I think a lot of folks we work with are naturally skeptical of technology. Um, and a lot of them, for just a variety of reasons, maybe they have undertaken a whole bunch of implementations and they haven't really seen the value. Or maybe they're like, hey, I've been in this for 50 years. I know how to do it. This is like my, my process. And so um, one thing I think that's been really, really helpful for us is just that mantra of meeting folks where they are and really encouraging them. So 
almost everyone on our platform, we, we try to reach out to, we try to make ourselves available. We also try to lead with how this is helpful for them. And so, hey, we've seen this can give you back 50% of your time, or hey, here's some examples of other folks in different states, and this is why this was useful for them. Mm -hmm. And so opening that and being really open to feedback and then taking that feedback and building into the product in a concentric loop has been a really good way of building that trust. But I think skepticism and you know information overload and technology fatigue, those are all headwinds that, you know, if you work in the gov tech space, that's like day to day. You feel that. And so uh, really good point to bring up and things that we we think about a lot. Yeah, um, yeah I have a question. Um kind of around like how you're making sure that what's being posted, or if you are even making sure what being what's being posted is like that like accurate or correct, you know, um, talking about the example of like, oh, here's a summary on this 50 page document, but like, is there a liability involved of like people posting on this platform? If it's geared towards government agencies, like I think there's a higher level of trust involved rather than like Reddit or Quora. So just like how you're navigating that challenge. Yeah, another like really thoughtful question. I think that's part of the reason why this is a unique tool compared to some of those other more open forums Every single, we call them spaces on our platform. Every space we have set up is super secure and moderated by someone. So that means the liability. So, you know, examples, one of our customers is the like convener of homelessness prevention in Connecticut. So that means anytime someone's asking a question and getting an answer, it's really that entity who's moderating the content and looking through. But we do a ton on our end to sort of make sure like people are getting digests of what's been shared. And we do like bi-weekly reviews with everybody. And there are really interesting moderator tools to help flag or hide or view content. But it's really about making sure people understand like here's who's in this space. Here's who's moderating. When you get an answer, it's from this entity. And the entity knows that they're responsible. And so that's how you kind of mitigate some of the like free flowing, like basically randos doing input into the Q&A, like you want it to be closed and secure and trusted. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the really informative conversation. You know, I'm curious, you talk a lot about connecting all these government workers and especially from like different places. I'm curious, you know, in a time when there's a lot of political polarization, how it, do you think this is some a challenge that becomes more difficult because while a lot of work is nonpartisan in the government space. People inherently do have political ideologies that would be different than, say, Utah and where you're working here in Boston. So I'm curious about building that connection. Yeah, these are all great questions. I would say a lot of the folks that we work with are doing jobs that are like core bread and butter government jobs. Like no matter who is in office or you know what is, these are like the jobs that folks have to do that like keep the lights on for government. And so a lot of the folks we work with are not super concerned with uh, like where the political spectrum is, but much more concerned of like, how do we do the job and how do we help our constituency? Um, and so it's it's just a great question because our focus by, by nature is really trying to be on that level of government. Um, and we really want to help those types of individuals. But to be fair, like a lot of really interesting conversations happen on our platform, mm -hmm. like we're working in the child welfare space in a couple different states. Like some are red states, some are blue states. And like some of the conversations they're having are like, hey, we've been trying this model that's government led for decades and not seeing good results. In this state, we're trying like a more nonprofit led model where we're like diverting resources to organizations that have better track record and people like debate, is that a good or bad thing? Like who should be responsible? Like what are the outcomes? But So we're kind of like seeing some of those conversations, but then the work doesn't necessarily feel particularly like politically charged because of the jobs. More questions. Yeah, I have another question. Um, when you were talking about how you were like curating the feed and the space and making sure that it's like not overwhelming, but also making sure that there's enough resources, like what type of are you like getting feedback from your customers on that or is it more just like this is really overwhelming for me when I look at it and it's hard for me to find information so kind of how are you striking that balance of making sure that all the information that someone might need is there but not in a way that's like very overwhelming or overstimulating you sound like like a member of our product team it's like the exact <laughs> combo we're always having I think in government like the bread and butter of how it runs is like email lists and imagine an email you're on 30 email lists and you're on like 100 reply all chains where like 
no one's particularly like savvy with technology like in a lot of these spaces so people thousands and thousands of reply all like me too got it great like all day so if you're a government worker like probably you have three thousand unread emails at any given time and you have no clue where you're looking for anything so we've built a bunch of features that for example you can like cc a roundtable email address and everything then populates on a thread so you get like one email at the end of the day that says like here's what you missed here's who saw this and here's the document so that's like a very granular example it doesn't sound so like crazy complicated on the tech front but it's super helpful for people like okay great i'm going to mute all email notifications from all my listservs and just check this once a day and we've also created a bunch of features that let users sort of like engage how they want to because people have different noise thresholds so there are some folks who are like I am really eagerly awaiting like a new grant because I'm trying to buy this new piece of technology. So I want to get notified anytime that word is brought up. And so we let you do that. And other people are like, I am so overwhelmed. Like this just feels like too much to me. Just send me like one digest every now and then with what's happening. And so we do that too. And we let users sort of curate their own experience. And then that gives them a little bit of ownership over that like signal to noise ratio challenge. And then it also lets them like actually find what's useful to them. Are there any, you maybe think of this barriers to entry that you impose for users? Like, um, you know, is it limited to folks who are currently working in the public sector or like, I don't know, is, you know, what are your sort of thoughts around that? Um, just ensuring that it's a platform of the users that you want it to be? Yeah. So um, every space in Roundtable. Uh, actually, you have to be permission into it. So your a moderator has to actually say you are who you say you are, and we want to welcome you to the space. And so there's different flavors of the types of users that they pull in, but um, no one can just sign up for our platform and then be pulled into it. There's always an active sort of check and verification that you are the individual that you say you are. And you have a reason for joining the environment. Um, so in that way, we're we're different than like a Facebook group. Um, and there are a lot of Facebook groups that actually exist out there where tons of people just get pulled in all the time. We have a, a lot more checks on um, the reason for being and reason for joining. Great. Sure. Right here. Yep. <laughs> um, what's the uh, expected revenue model? Where's the money going to come from? Yeah, it's like a SaaS product. So government agencies have tool budgets, like they buy Microsoft Team, they buy Salesforce. They, so they also now buy Civic Roundtable and you buy seats and services. So. We were basically just trying to fit into tool budgets of government agencies. And when you sell, do you sell to at the top or are you selling department by department? We sell, so it depends. So we'll sell to, for example, like the Office of Homelessness Prevention, and they'll say, all right, we want, you know, 300 seats and we're going to open it up to these people. So you sell to the host, whoever that is. Mm -hmm. Ellen, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm just curious because it seems like as this builds and grows, you're just like building a giant database of like, all of the government information that people might need. Do you ever see a world in which you will open that up to other spheres or people or, you know, now that, now that you eventually will have all of this information in one space, or is that just expected to stay in the governments? Like what is your? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we want to be really, really ethical stewards of government data. So we don't see a world in which we will be ever releasing government data or selling government data. Um, our end of the bargain is we build tools that are really easy to use and folks find value, but we don't see ourselves being um, individuals that are using that swath of data um, in any other way. The one thing we could, can do and have helped customers do is like we convened, for example, this year, a symposium of a bunch of different states. And we said, like, let's have a discussion about what's going on in election administration. And people really liked it because there's like what's going on in the news and then there's like what's going on in the field. And we had really interesting conversational data about like, OK, here's a big challenge, like recruiting poll workers has gotten way harder. Like, that's not the kind of thing that the news is talking about, but it's what's on all of their minds. So we can convene really interesting, like, you know, more in touch conversations, I guess, with public servants. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Question. Um, you spoke about like pushback as far as government resistance, like disrupting the status quo. Have you had like pushback? I guess from like as counterparts on the market, or do you see yourselves having any competitors or counterparts? I guess not only in the United States, but I guess companies, I guess in other countries that kind of do a similar thing. Just wondering. Good question. Yeah, I think 
some people view us when like government agencies are looking at us they think like oh are you like slack or like base camp or like kind of knowledge based tools and our answer to that is like we are very similar to that but we're built we're hosted in a way that's like secure for government so we're differentiated in some ways then there are other networks that are more focused on like public sector kind of upskilling so there's like a group called apolitical for example and they run like little courses for public servants like oh if you didn't get like PowerPoint training, we'll give you a mini module. Or if you didn't, if you want to know how to like apply for a grant, here's like a training. But we kind of think that we're in this unique space of pulling from ideas in both of those buckets, but being the only tool that's like purpose built this way. And I'm absolutely positive there are more competitors than we even know about, but it's like a real problem for a lot of government officials. So this is like something that people have tried to solve in different ways, but we haven't yet come with a direct competitor. Sure. Any last questions from the group? No? Okay, well, thank you for all of the fantastic thank questions so that you asked. <laughs>